I'm Mehdi Razavi, uh, one of the electrophysiologists at Texas Heart Institute, Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, I've been tasked with the subject of rhythm versus rate, has the tie changed since affirm? Uh, specifically, uh, I've been tasked with um, uh, kind of going back and uh, revisiting the data that's been accumulated since uh, the seminal study uh, in 2002 um, that was released uh, in the AFFIRM investigation. This was an NIH-sponsored study uh, that uh, looked at rhythm control strategy versus rate control. And it was a seminal paper because it essentially, at the time it appeared, it settled the discussion and the argument uh, with regards to management of uh, atrial fibrillation. It found that rhythm control strategy offers no survival adv advantage over rate control. As a matter of fact, there's a lower risk of adverse drug effects um, with the rate uh, control strategy. And uh, the study also found that anticoagulation to, should be continued in this group of high-risk patients. Um, and based on that, uh, there this data that you see right now, you could see that there's really no, um, no obvious uh, uh, difference uh, in terms of outcomes uh, with these patients. And if anything, there was a trend that the rhythm control uh, patients had uh, a slightly higher uh, risk of mortality. Keep in mind, however, that um, uh, the, the statement to the right of the screen, no survival advantage with DC cardioversion and antiarrhythmic drugs. Uh, and if you note, something else is missing there, and that's catheter-based ablation. Uh, just as the study was coming out, uh, catheter ablation was starting to get its uh, feet under itself and taking its uh, first steps. So uh, they... It, at that point, uh, the conclusions uh, of, of the firm trial, which were stated as, uh, as follows, management of atrial fibrillation with rhythm control strategy offers no survival advantage over the rate control strategy. There are potential advantages such as lower risk of adverse drug effects with the rate control strategy. Anticoagulation should be continued. Uh, this conclusion was uh, essentially as a, an edict that was uh, followed and uh, for many years uh, in, in clinical practice. Uh, however, it really is time to revisit the conclusions of this study. Um, as I noted a second ago, uh, the biggest limitation of this study, uh, it's simply that it's not relevant these days. The vast majority of patients are uh, undergoing catheter ablation for rhythm uh, management and not uh, pharmacologic use. And we are going to kind of dive into the details of some of these studies to, to make the point that catheter ablation uh, does not, uh, should not be precluded based on the AFFIRM uh, study. So um, why go beyond the AFFIRM trial? Rate control is different than rhythm control for all patients, and rhythm control strategies are continually improving. We also can't lose sight of special populations, those with coronary disease, those with heart failure, and those with valvular heart disease. Uh, these patients uh, often tend to have the greatest benefit from uh, other types of interventions, and perhaps catheter ablation is the same. So we're going to review some of the more recent data. We're going to go in chronological order, and at the end we will um, try to tease out our conclusions based on more uh, recent uh, clinical studies. So. A couple of things. First of all, the end point, as we said with Affirm, was one of mortality. And quality of life was not something that was necessarily looked at. However, if uh, a, a retrospective um, analysis of that uh, data, a quality of life in patients with atrial fibrillation, uh, found that actually in those same patients, um, the, the post hoc analysis of Affirm, more symptomatic heart failure occurred in the rate control group. Uh, and patients were less symptomatic in sinus rhythm. So in terms of quality of life, that was something that was clearly uh, missing with Affirm, that those patients who did manage to um, control their rhythm actually felt better than those who were in a rate control strategy. Uh, shortly after the Affirm trial was, uh, uh, was released, a, another trial was published in the New England Journal of Medicine looking at catheter ablation for atrial uh, fibrillation in those patients with congestive heart failure. And this really was the first study that gave us an inkling of how critical rhythm control is important uh, is uh, in these uh, group of patients. What you can see here is that uh, in those patients who had rhythm control uh, and heart failure, uh, over time there's a progressive improvement in left ventricular ejection fraction, uh, left ventricular fractional shortening, uh, left ventricular end diastolic and end systolic volumes. Uh, 
Um, and it, this was uh, uh, seen across all uh, categories of patients in this trial, all the patients with heart failure. Uh, it did not matter whether or not they had um, uh, ischemic heart disease or, or not. Um, the, the benefit was real. You can see a, a dramatic improvement in uh, LV fractional shortening, in um, a number of echocardiographic parameters, and again, the ejection fraction uh, itself. The next study is the CAMTAF trial, which is a randomized control trial of catheter ablation versus medical treatment of atrial fibrillation and heart failure. This study found that catheter ablation is effective in restoring sinus rhythm in selected patients with persistent AF and heart failure, and it can improve left ventricular function, functional capacity, and heart failure symptoms compared with rate control. In this slide, we can see the Kaplan-Meier curve showing the survival frame from atrial fibrillation or other atrial tachycardias after the last ablation procedure. At six months, this number was 81%, and at 12 months, it was 73%. Here we can see a number of uh, other parameters uh, that we can see uh, were uh, significantly improved when you, combine, when you compare catheter ablation for atrial fibrillation versus um, medical management. We can see that the New York Heart Association class, BNP levels, uh, LV ejection fraction, all these variables were significantly improved in the catheter ablation group uh, versus those uh, who uh, underwent medical management. Based on these uh, preliminary studies, uh, the, the so-called Castle AF study, catheter ablation for atrial fibrillation with heart failure, actually uh, asked the hardest question, do patients benefit in terms of mortality uh, if they have uh, from catheter ablation of atrial fibrillation uh, if they have heart failure? Uh, this patient enrolled patients who had ischemic and non-ischemic cardiomyopathies, heart failure, and not necessarily symptoms related purely to the atrial fibrillation itself. And as you can see here, uh, the patients across the board in terms of uh, probability of uh, survival, in terms of probability of hospitalization, and in terms of the combined probability of both ablation was superior uh, to medical therapy. And the difference was actually uh, quite uh, st striking in some cases, as low as uh, p-values of low as uh, 0 0.004. This set up uh, the stage for what was probably the largest EP clinical study in terms of catheter ablation in atrial fibrillation patients. Um, that was, uh, it was an NIH funded, spearheaded by Dr. Doug Packer at Mayo Clinic. This was an extremely important uh, clinical trial and it showed the primary endpoint that catheter ablation is not superior to drug therapy for CV outcomes at five years among patients with new onset or untreated atrial fibrillation that required therapy. The study additionally found that there was a significant reduction in death or CV hospitalization with ablation, and on as treated analysis, ablation demonstrated superior efficacy to drug therapy. In addition, recurrent AF and atrial fibrillation burden were lower with ablation compared with drug therapy alone. Catheter ablation was associated with a significant reduction in recurrent atrial fibrillation compared with drug therapy. Similarly, among patients with NYHA class two to four symptoms, most of whom have heart failure with preserved EF, their ejection, there appeared to be a benefit in the primary endpoint and all cause mortality with ablation. Um, no clear sex-based differences were noted in overall safety or uh, efficacy in this large uh, randomized trial. Um, further results from the Cabana trial uh, showed that in patients with atrial fibrillation enrolled in the Cabana trial who had clinically diagnosed stable heart failure at trial entry, catheter ablation pro produced clinically important um, uh, improvements in survival, freedom from AF recurrence, and quality of life relative to drug therapy. So this was a, a looking at uh, the recurrences and quality of life and not focused on um, more a primary endpoint of mortality and hospitalizations. So they looked at a subgroup with heart failure and they found that there is a mortality benefit. So that's the take home message here, uh, addressing this special group. And we see this repeated across 
studies, even in Cabana that overall was a negative study, that it seems that patients with heart failure really do response to this, uh, to this intervention uh, quite nicely and quite effectively. You can see here that compared uh, to drug, uh, drug therapy, the incidence of overall events was lower. Uh, again, this is the Cabana data uh, in those patients who had catheter ablation. Similarly, uh, overall, the uh, event rate of all-cause mortality by intention to treat among uh, Cabana patients with heart failure, uh, the incidence of uh, mortality was lower with ablation than with drug therapy. Uh, also, cumulative incidence of first occurrence, uh, recurrence of atrial fibrillation in the post-blanking period among Cabana heart failure patients um, used the Cabana ECG recording system. You can see that the freedom from recurrence uh, was uh, much higher in those patients who underwent catheter ablation as opposed to drug therapy. Finally, the question may be, well, okay, we have kind of uh, settled that perhaps patients with heart failure should have catheter ablation, perhaps catheter ablation in and of itself. Uh, we've seen even in a unselected group of patients at Cabana actually improved quality of life was associated um, not necessarily with improved mortality, but a number of other endpoints uh, such as even recurrent hospitalizations. So let's say that we are interested in um, approaching these patients using catheter ablation. When should we do this? Should we do this early on or should we wait as things, uh, as the atrial fibrillation progresses? So to answer this question, uh, there, uh, another study was performed and it looked at early uh, rhythm control therapy in patients with atrial fibrillation. And in this case, what was, uh, what was done is uh, all, all 1,300 patients who were randomly assigned to early rhythm control received an antiarrhythmic drug or underwent atrial fibrillation uh, ablation. Uh, this uh, really replicated clinical practice patterns. Of the 13, of the 1,400 patients, about 15% had a triggered visit uh, to adapt rhythm control therapy. At two years, 900 uh, of the 1,400 patients, or about two-thirds of them, were still receiving rhythm control therapy. Uh, usual care consisted of treatment with rate control therapy without rhythm control therapy throughout follow-up in the majority of patients assigned to this group. Initially, about 95% of the 1,400 patients in this group had their condition managed without rhythm control therapy. At two years, about 85% were still not receiving uh, rhythm control therapy or uh, antiarrhythmic drugs. And you can see here that the cumulative uh, incidence uh, of uh, the primary outcome of death or cardiovascular causes uh, there was a lower incidence in the early rhythm control population uh, than there was that uh, using the usual or standard uh, care. Uh, this is uh, another study. It's not really addressing the question of using catheter ablation in patients to improve mortality uh, outcomes. But I think it's really important to take a step back and remember that AFFIRM, once again, was not a trial really of rhythm control versus rate control. It was a trial of drug therapy versus rate control. And that's very important because what you can see is if you look at a number of larger studies, taking ablation and comparing it to drug therapy, antiarrhythmic drugs, it frankly is not even close. The success of ablation as compared to antiarrhythmic drugs is essentially settled and there really is, is no debate these days that there is a significantly higher um, maintenance of normal sinus rhythm when undergoing catheter ablation as opposed to antiarrhythmic drugs. And again, this segues back to the original finding or the original uh, population um, and the original firm study um, that really did not use catheter ablation. Again, I keep emphasizing this point because a firm is really not how clinical atrial fibrillation rhythm control is performed uh, in, in 2021, not even close. Uh, another study comparing antiarrhythmic drug therapy and radiofrequency catheter ablation in patients with atrial fibrillation, uh, again, reinforced the same message. Again, I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm not trying to beat a dead horse, but I'm trying to make sure that the message is getting through that uh, 
uh, what we're looking at is, is a comparison of catheter ablation and if, if you replace catheter ablation for drug therapy, you should expect significant, significant uh, changes and differences in outcomes. And uh, certainly we don't want to retrofit this data to affirm, but it's something that every clinician and every patient should keep in mind when making these very important decisions. Another study, uh, again, I uh, looked at ablation versus amiodarone. And I like to use this study because as we know, amiodarone is the, by far the most powerful antiarrhythmic drug. And even when using amiodarone, there really, it was not even close in terms of the incidence of recurrence of atrial fibrillation. The amiodarone group did far worse than uh, the catheter ablation group for maintenance of uh, normal rhythm. I'm going to make a slight change in direction right now to, to close off this talk because we've talked about a catheter ablation of atrial fibrillation. And, you know, Dr. Coulter tasked uh, me with uh, looking and revisiting a firm. And that just doesn't mean that we have to consider catheter ablation of atrial fibrillation. You can actually perform rate control, and one of the most effective ways of uh, performing um, rate control is AV node ablation and pacing. AV node ablation with permanent ventricular pacing currently is reasonable to control heart rate when pharmacological therapy is inadequate and rhythm control is not achievable. It's actually a class 2A indication in the guidelines. AV node ablation provides highly effective control of ventricular rate in patients in whom pharmacological rate control has failed or the pharmacologic uh, attempts have been associated with unacceptable side effects um, and or toxicities. Uh, AV node ablation improves quality of life, it reduces mortality, and in patients with reduced left ventricular function who may require biventricular pacing after AV node ablation, uh, their outcomes have also demonstrated to be excellent. As we said, Affirm, we're not trying to critique simply or be advocating for catheter ablation in all circumstances. There were other more subtle differences between Affirm as it was done then and our clinical management these days. Uh, we now have a well-established CHATS2 VASC scoring system to uh, precisely, more precisely, risk stratify patients for the need for anticoagulation. And very, very importantly, uh, novel uh, anticoagulants such as uh, dabigatran, rivaroxaban, or apixaban were simply never used in the AFFIRM trial. So uh, that's some, a, a very significant difference between current clinical practice and what was seen in, uh, in AFFIRM. So in conclusion, rate, contr rate versus rhythm control strategy, uh, rate control does not equal rhythm control for all, and that question has to be significantly revisited. The AFFIRM trial, its validity in current clinical practice is perhaps more limited, uh, and I would say confidently at least a bit more limited now than it was in 2002. Uh, ablation is increasingly demonstrated to be safe and effective in selected patients, uh, especially in those patients with heart failure. AV node ablation and pacemaker is reasonable to control heart rate when pharmacological therapy is an ad inadequate and rhythm control is not achievable. And the novel uh, oral anticoagulants are safe and effective. I would like to thank the organizers for providing uh, this opportunity uh, and thank you very much.